My name's George Farmer, and I'm very privileged today to be able to uh, execute my passion, which is aquascaping. Uh, thanks to Oise for inviting me down. Thanks to uh, World of Water, Vista, for having me as well. I really appreciate it. And hopefully, uh, by the end of this demo, you might be a little bit inspired, uh, might learn something, and you can take these uh, experiences away with you and hopefully improve your own hobby, start, start the hobby, whatever your level of experience Hopefully you can gain something uh, by this demo. So a little bit about me. Um, my name's George Farmer. I've been a full-time aquascaper now for about five, six years. Been doing it as a hobby for about 15. Um, aquascaping is absolutely my passion and I believe it can really enrich people's lives and I'm really kind of blessed to be able to make a living from it. So for me, aquascaping is uh, the best thing about it is the therapeutic value. Uh, that I personally get from it. And I know a lot of other people do as well. Um, it's something really kind of relaxing and nurturing about sitting in front of a, a beautiful aquascape. And hopefully by the end of today, you can maybe learn a little bit of how to do that yourselves. And more importantly, get that kind of therapeutic value from it as well. So this is an Awaze Highline 300. Uh, where's Martin? Martin is buying this. So he's going to pay very close attention, hopefully, to what we're doing today. Um, I've been working with Oise for a couple of years now. I have a Highline 175 in my home. I really love the whole aquarium system, really high quality. It is a premium brand, so you, you pay accordingly. Uh, but you get just a really nice finish, well-designed, reliable. I really like the, um, the drilled base. So you have the filter in here. The filter goes on like a sliding shelf. So you can take it out to maintain it really easily. And all of the electrics come up through this dry weir here. So you can actually have the whole aquarium right up against your living room wall or wherever you've got it. So you don't have to, you know, if you space is at a premium and you need to kind of get it all the way up there, you can do that without any cables along the back. Um, the hinge, it has a kind of hinged lid, which is just a push to release. And it's really nice because you can have it all the way back and then you've got a suspended light here which slides backwards and forwards so you can maintain the tank really easily. Materials um, are like a composite so they don't rust, they don't warp like you can with wood. Uh, just, just like a really nice high quality finish. Comes in different cabinet colours, I think is it the white and the black and grey. So today I'm going to be creating a uh, nature aquarium style aquascape. So nature aquarium was a term coined by the late great Takashi Amano. He invented this nature aquarium concept where you're getting a slice of nature from outside and then bringing that into your aquarium. It doesn't have to be a direct copy of nature, although some people will, you know, do almost shrink entire landscapes into the aquarium. We call this diorama. But the style I'm going to be doing today is uh, what I like to call the classic nature aquarium. So just using natural elements together, wood, rocks, and plants, live plants, and creating something that's, like I said, not directly copying a scene from nature, but you're just getting this essence of nature. And I think as human beings in modern society right now, you know, we all live in a digital age where a lot of us may be a little bit removed from nature. We're kind of addicted to our smartphones and we kind of forget about the nature you know, around us. So to have you know, a nature aquarium in your living space, I think is a, it's a really nice way to re-engage with nature. We're gonna use a mixture of this JBL Manado, or Manado. It isn't my first choice, but it, because it's very, very light in, uh, in density. It's almost, um, wants to kind of float almost. And when you try to plant in it, it doesn't really have the great anchorage that I like to achieve. So I'm going to mix this with some regular kind of coarse quartz sand. And that's going to hopefully add a little bit of density to the substrate and allow the roots to anchor better. So I think this has a high cation exchange capacity, which means it will take in nutrients from the water column and then make those nutrients available to the plant roots. I don't think it contains many nutrients on its own, if you know what I mean. So you will have to add, where's Martin? You will have to add liquid fertilizers to this because there won't be much nutrients in the substrate itself, okay? So ideally, a plant will take in nutrients through its roots and through its leaves. A 
but it can adapt to either. So if you do have an inert substrate, it's a bit cloudy. If you do have an inert substrate, then just be mindful that you will need to dose more liquid fertilizer because the plant will need those nutrients for its leaves. Okay, now we're going to mix in, this is uh, an inert quartz gravel, it's got a really nice grain size actually, it's about one to two millimetre, which is perfect for most plant roots. So you can see the colour of this is a little bit different, so we'll mix it up and that's going to just create this environment which I want to um, ensure the roots stay nicely gripped. And I would just mix that up. When you're aquascaping, just have a think about where you're going to be sitting, when you're going to be viewing the tank, uh, mainly from, and then escape it, according, uh, escape it accordingly. So if you're viewing it from, let's say you're viewing it from this side, which is ideal, because you can actually bank up stuff here to hide this maybe. And then when you're viewing it from here, if we do like a triangular layout perhaps, you have low stuff down here, then leading up to taller background stuff, just gives you this lovely kind of sense of depth when you're looking into the aquarium. But if you're viewing it from the front, we can do the same thing. Obviously, foreground stuff, short, and then leading up to tall background stuff. Because Martin's going to be viewing it directly from the front, we can have the, the substrate fairly flat and actually along the horizontal axis, but actually sloping up towards the rear. And this will give us... Uh, an artificial kind of extra sense of depth like an optical illusion that the tank is actually wider than it really is. Once I put the hardscape in it's going to shift the substrate around so you don't need to worry about it being super flat. Here at World of Water Bista they've got an amazing selection of I think this is vine wood. Um, some really nice large pieces as you can see here and this immediately got my attention and I could sort of visualize this is going to fit in there quite nicely quite snug but actually just one piece can show you how, what a great impact you can make. So <clears throat> this is the, the, arguably the most kind of important part of the aquascaping process, the hardscape. So this is like the backbone of the layout. The stronger your hardscape, the stronger the aquascape that you can create and the less kind of emphasis you need to place on the plant. So there's almost a bit more room for forgiveness if you start off with a really strong hardscape. So if I could just get a volunteer to hold this light unit away for me. Thank you, sir. What's your name? Darren. Darren? Yeah. Thanks, Darren. If you just lift this off here just for a second. So it can only obviously go a few ways. It can't go this way. So Martin's going to be viewing it. Just try and put it down and relax if you can. It's probably quite... Um, but just have a kind of play. There's, only, there's a few different angles we can go at. So... I think I quite like to create almost a triangle to hide this inlet pipe here. So if you have this kind of main weight of the wood over to the left. Okay, you can put it down now, mate. Thank you. So we need to be mindful of, you know, whereabouts, foreground or background it's going to go. We want to allow some room for planting in front of it and behind it, so it kind of makes sense to put it fairly central. But straight away, you can see that's made a huge impact. It looks beautiful already, and it's a good lesson. You know, be bold with your hardscape. Don't just buy, you know, maybe pieces that are a little bit too small. Try to fill up that space as much as you can without making it look kind of too crowded. So I think that's almost perfect actually I'm really pleased with that piece we'll put a couple of stones in there we don't have to use rocks I mean this is so bold on its own you could get away without any out any stones or rocks 
But this grabbed my attention. I'm, I don't think I've ever actually used this before. I've seen it around, I think it's called Spaghetti Rock. Is that right? So I just thought it would match the sort of the harm, the colors and the, and the hue of the substrate. They kind of match quite nicely, blend in, in sort of like a harmony. And then I'm thinking, where am I going to put this? This is the biggest. I've got three stones here. <clears throat> and we, we usually use stones in odd numbers. It's like a, a traditional aquascaping thing. I always start off with the biggest. And we want to think about focal points. So if you split your tank into kind of three equal sections, horizontally and vertically, where these kind of lines intersect, that's where you want your kind of focal point to be. That gives the best kind of visual balance. So with that in mind, we've got our largest stone. Let's position it about a third of the way along. <clears throat> And then work our way down to the next size. And then the smallest piece. And you get a top tip, you can actually partially, that's going to make the tank really muddy. <clears throat> so top tip, wash your hardscape if you can, otherwise it will cloud the water. So if you partially bury your rock and then offer up the gravel around the base of the rock, it kind of creates this like, much more natural appearance, like the, the earth's been eroded away and left the rock exposed. Maybe this left stone <coughs> needs to be twisted this way a bit. So if you look at the stones right now, they've got kind of these natural lines running through. That we call that like strata. What I like to do is have the strata almost converging at a right angle, like perpendicular to each other. So ideally, I'd have the strata coming up this way and then these two, you've got a natural strata going this way, and then hopefully they kind of come together like that. So by rotating this slightly clockwise, <clears throat> that tiny adjustment might not look much, but it, should, it will have a, quite a big impact on the whole balance. Now I'm just going to offer up the gravel a bit more to the, to the wood gives a better sense of depth. The gravel does go down behind this kind of metal line here, so we do have a little bit more room that you might, might, might think. Okay, when it comes to planting, uh, it's, I think it's worth talking about the benefits of aquarium plants to start with. Aquarium plants perform lots of beneficial functions in an aquarium. Uh, they, they grow, and by growing they produce oxygen. Uh, they take in harmful nutrients such as uh, nitrogen compounds, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, etc. Uh, they provide a sense of security and shelter for the livestock and they look beautiful and that's kind of where I come in and like, like to make an aquascape beautiful out of aquarium plants and as you can see the hardscape as well. So they do require a little bit of extra care compared to a regular kind of community tank. You can always focus a little bit more on lighting but even said saying that you can stick to really easy plants and you can grow these in almost any aquarium. So if, you, if you're not into planted aquariums yet, then you know, try your hand at some super easy plants and then I'm sure you can succeed. So when it comes to aquascaping, I like to break it down into four basic elements. Foreground, midground, background, and then finally the epiphyte plants. These are plants that attach to the hardscape. And I plant in that order, start at the front, and then gradually work my way to the back. And the reason for that is if we had kind of long dangling stem plants or vallis or whatever, if you start planting that right at the beginning, it can kind of fall over and, and block your, your way into planting everywhere else. So that's the reason I start from the front and work my way back. And then finally, attach the epiphyte plants, and I'll show you obviously how I do all of that, including preparing the plant. So Martin's going to be injecting CO2. This gives us a lot more wiggle room for choosing the plants. You can grow, you know, with a good, with a good enough lighting and good enough CO2, you can pretty much grow anything you like. You need other things, good nutrient circulation, etc. But those two things are the most important, good light and good CO2. So with that in mind, we can help ourselves to any of these plants. I think it's parvula. Um, there's a sicularis, which is taller, and there's a couple of others which are even taller. But this looks like the dwarf variety, so I'm going to say it's Eleocaris parvula. 
And to prepare it, just simply remove the plastic pot. Normally the rock wool or the mineral wool, this stuff here, it's basically fiberglass, just normally comes in two kind of halves. And then you can just tease the, the plants away from it. And you end up with this. And then we separate that into, say, five to ten portions. The more you split them up, the more coverage you get, the more kind of economical, excuse me, it will be. Um, but yeah, you don't, want to, you don't want to be going any kind of bigger than that. The, the smaller the clump, the, kind of, the quicker the carpeting effect you'll get as well. So if you've got the time and the patience and you want to save a bit of money, then just you know, split them up as much as you like, basically. It grows quite compact. It's almost like a small hygrophila. And if you trim it, keep it well trimmed, it will just sprout new shoots and you'll get a more and more uh, bushy appearance. I like to use this, not necessarily right at the front of the aquarium, but just behind the, the, the far foreground plants. It's also great to plant around hardscape. It just look, makes a nice transition from a really low plant into hardscape or another plant. So exactly the same way as preparing as before, but you're not going to get as many portions out of this than the, than the hair grass. And it's worth talking about the need to plant heavily. So in a new aquarium, algae has really got a huge kind of chance of getting you. So what we have to do is focus on planting heavily, make sure those plants are really healthy, which we've got today, thankfully. Thank you, uh, World of Water. The heavier we plant, the better the quality of those plants, the, the more we promote healthy plant growth, the less algae we get. So if you think about algae, and plants always in competition with each other. By nourishing the plants and kind of really focusing on the plants, you kind of starve away the algae. That's the easiest way to think about it. But always think of algae. It's always there, kind of lurking in the background. Any opportunity it will get, it will kind of try to take over. So, but by really focusing on healthy plant growth and good maintenance, you shouldn't get any algae issues. Okay, so we've got, I think, three or four different uh, species of crypts. This is Wendetii brown. Um, like I said, it will go brown. It will go quite a bit taller as well. And the interesting thing about crypts is that they often change their leaf shape and their colour depending on the environment they're kept in. Um, originally, these are grown in the nurseries, actually out of water. We call that hydroponic, hydroponically. So this bit here, the pot is in basically nutrient-rich circulating water. And then this bit here actually grows out into the air where it's got much more access to CO2. It's physically more robust because it has to support its own weight. Uh, it has more light and it doesn't get any algae on it uh, and they grow quicker. So this is the reason they grow them in the greenhouses and then obviously we put them in our aquarium and what it has to do then is adapt from its out of water growth, which is what we call emerged, to its underwater growth, which we call submerged. Now, during this process, some plants uh, can make this adaption, this uh, kind of transition with no problem, but some plants are quite sensitive. Crips are one of those plants that they might shed their leaves don't be disheartened, just give it, some, give it some time and some patience, trim away any affected leaves, and then you should get new growth fairly quickly afterwards. But the crypts are great. They don't need much light, they're slow growing, uh, don't need CO2 injection, and there's so many different varieties. There's probably about 15, 20 different types of crypts you can buy quite easily in the hobby. So preparing them, exactly the same process. Just remove the plastic pot. Peel away the mineral wool. And then you can plant that as a wanna. I like to actually trim the roots back as well to about two centimetres. That stimulates new root growth and it also makes planting easier. Now we can plant that as it is or we can actually split that up into more portions as well. And by doing that, you're going to get more coverage because with every new portion, it's going to grow a new amount of leaves and you can quite quickly get a really nice dense planting kind of, you know what I mean. I'm running out of words. It's good, isn't it? You can get foreground crypts, so parva stays about this tall, all the way to kind of balansai, which will grow meters long if you, let, if you let it. And all the sizes in between as well. There you go, thank you very much. Okay, I'll start planting these now and then we'll move on to background as a separate topic. So good old aquascaping tweezers, lots of different shapes and sizes. This is my favorite pair. I've had this well over 10 years now, these, these tweezers. Not as old as the colander, but nearly. So just plant really simple, get your portion, push it into the soil, the substrate, and then uh, there we go. Um, 
Is, is there any more aquascaping tools in the store? Have we got any? Can, can I borrow a pair of tweezers and we'll get a helper to... Yeah, thanks, mate. Now, what, I, what you do, a uh, good tip for you to ensure even coverage along the fronts or wherever, and you've got a limited number of plants and you want to kind of get the best kind of results, I always kind of work almost mathematically. So put one in the middle, one either side. And then just keep dividing in two every time, planting halfway in between. Eleocaris, it's a hair grass and it will send out runners under the substrate and it'll pop up new leaf blades and it'll keep repeating this process if you've got good growth conditions. And eventually you'll end up with a solid kind of carpet or a lawn. And it looks quite beautiful. And it's, you know, it's a very fine textured leaf. And when you get a solid lawn of this, it just looks really nice, like a, almost like a manicured lawn that you'd find in your garden. So it will have good... You're going to upgrade the lighting, aren't you? Uh, yeah. yeah. So we'll have good light. We'll have good CO2, because Martin's going to put CO2 injection on it. We've got a fairly good substrate. Not perfect, but with good, nu good nutrients from the liquid fertilizer, those plants are going to be really well fed. We're going to have an Awaze Biomaster Thermo 600 filter. It's not on there right now, but that goes in here. And that's going to provide filtration, mechanical filtration, chemical and biological filtration, although only chemical filtration if we use the carbon sponges. And that will provide, obviously, the filtration and then circulation as well. Circulation is quite kind of underestimated the, the kind of importance of circulation in a planted aquarium, especially with CO2 injection. So let's say uh, Martin puts his, if he has it in, you're going to go inline diffuser or, yeah. yeah? So the water, and then you can either use a spray bar on there or you can just use a single jet nozzle. My suggestion to you is, um, I tried the spray bar for a few months on my 175, yeah. and then I found actually I got a better kind of overall circulation just by having the outlet hooks over here and then just pointing in that direction. And then you get a really nice kind of circular, like gyre effect. Um, and then because you've got inline CO2, uh, because it's quite a powerful filter, I think it's about 1200 liters per hour, you'll get and because you're inline CAT, you'll get all those micro bubbles going all the way around the tank really nicely, yeah? And that's going to feed the plants uh, evenly. You want, a, you want kind of an even circulation. So if, for instance, we had a, a very kind of low-powered filter and uh, the circulation levels weren't high enough, these plants down here, because the water's coming out over here, these plants down here aren't going to hardly get any CO2. It's all going to be captured by the plants over here. So these will grow much slower, these will grow much quicker, and you'll end up with a, these plants are just basically going to suffer. So it's really important to get a really good all-round circulation. I like to aim for the tank's volume. So let's say this is 300 litres. Uh, five times to ten times that we want in the power of the filter. I've made an executive decision. I've decided to add a different species in, on top of the Eleocaris. Uh, my Cranthum and Monte Carlo, relatively new to the hobby, it's probably been around about 10 years. And it's a, quite an easy carpeting plant, similar, similar to Hemianthus cuba, but Hemianthus cuba is a lot more demanding, you'll need more CO2, etc. This is a lot easier. It has a slightly bigger leaf shape, but in terms of its growth, it's fairly similar to cuba. And I'm going to mix this up in between the grass. This is going to create a more complex texture, which just looks more natural, more attractive. So... Same process as before when we're preparing the pots. And again, you can split this up. You could each actually split the individual stems if you wanted. So you've probably got about 100 or 200 there. And, if you were, and I have done it before with one pot. You can plant a whole tank just by, <laughs> if you're a bit crazy like me, spend eight hours. But you can do that if you really want to. But I'd split that up into probably four or five smaller portions. Another top tip is, um, if you can, make sure you buy your plants as fresh as they can be. So have a, have a chat with the, the store, the staff, find out when they get their fresh shipments of plants and then get them as soon as you can. And that's just going to help ensure they stay healthy for longer 
and give you more chance of success in the long term. So our stop point is in Monte Carlo, if we can all fit around the tank. So it's a little bit more tricky to plant this. It has a very delicate root structure. Don't be um, too bothered if it looks a bit ugly in the tank to start with. Once it's had uh, about 24 hours or so of lighting, it should start to kind of find its own way and look more natural. But you might notice we're planting into the substrate dry. I used to, I used to actually fill up the water, you know, just above the substrate line and plant it until it wet. But actually, I find this is a lot cleaner, easier, and less, you get less chance of the actual uh, plant floating up when you do add water properly. OK, I'm going to move on to the Staragini now. The guys are just planting the rest of the Monte Carlo in between the hair grass. I'm going to put this around the base of the stones. So this is going to kind of act as a transition from the low kind of carpeting plant, the Eleocaris and the Monte Carlo. This will go around the stone and create this kind of natural transition. Okay, next we'll go on to some Cryptochorony Wendertii Green. That's going to act as another mid-ground plant, so we'll plant that along here. Now, Crypts do really like to take a lot of their nutrients through their roots, so it could be a good idea to add some more nutrients via root capsules. Uh, different, there's different brands. I'm not sure what the guys here stock. But these are great just for target feeding these plant roots, especially if you've got like an inert substrate like we have today. Uh, another good thing about crypts is they'll grow almost in the dark. So you, if you've got a low light tank and you're struggling for ideas, then crypts is an option. Anubius as well doesn't need much light. Uh, Java fern's a funny one. I mean, it's a very popular plant and it, it will survive without much light. But actually to get the most out of Java fern, you really need to give it like, you know, decent lighting, ideally CO2 especially with the trident fern, which is, in my experience, the, the most kind of challenging. I mean, it's not hard, but because it's labelled as an easy plant, you know, some people struggle with it. So do bear that in mind. I'd always recommend CA2 injection uh, anyway, if you want to grow plants. You'll just get the best out of that plant. It'll grow quicker, it'll reward you more quickly, and you can grow a lot more kind of bigger range of plants. But equally, if you're on a tight budget and you want to take things super slow, then... Do non-CO2, but just bear in mind, you, you know, your choice of species will be more limited. So we'll just give those a bit of a spray. Okay, so we've done uh, the four to mid grounds. Let's move all on to the mid to background now. Some more crypts. Anyone want to help prepare them? So I'll leave Paul to prepare the more crypts, and we'll just add those behind the current ones. I want to talk about stem plants. So although this is quite short at the moment, it will grow a lot taller. Uh, this is Ludwigia diamond red. Um, never actually heard of this variety. I guess it's similar to Palustris and will hopefully turn a nice red colour. Interesting thing about a lot of plants is they'll, they'll dramatically change. We talked about uh, emerged out of water growth versus underwater growth. This is in its out of water growth form, emerged form right now. Um, you can see it's quite, the, the, the stems are quite stiff. Uh, there's not much colour on the leaf. Over the next few weeks, uh, next few weeks this will adapt to its underwater form. It will gain more colour. The leaves will become a lot kind of um, looser, more limp, because it hasn't got, they haven't got to support their own weight in the water. And yeah, it will just, over the weeks, you'll see a, a gradual transformation. So exactly the same way as preparing as before. And then what you can do, you can, again, if you're kind of limited budget and you want to get the most kind of spread out of your plants, you can plant the stems individually. But you don't get that kind of dense appearance. So... I like to kind of group them in bunches of three, two or three. And then because this is going to turn into a, you know, so we, this will go a lot more red, ideally. The more light you have, the more red it will go, basically. The, um, it's really important because, because of the red, it's quite a high impact colour and your eye is kind of naturally drawn towards that red. So it's really important that we position this appropriately in the tank. We don't just want to be sticking it in there randomly, random positions. Think about your focal point. Is that it for the, yeah. So, I mean, ideally around here, but it's going to be shaded by this wood here. And this does like more light. So I'm going to, so that was a third of the way along there. I'm going to go two thirds of the way along and then plant it around here. And that's the kind of the best kind of focal point, I would say, for the red plant. 
So you probably can't see it right now, but in a few weeks it's going to grow taller and it will add a really nice high impact backdrop to the aquascape. The more plants we have, the healthier those plants are, the less chance of algae we get. So algae is really kind of common in a new setup. So that's why it's particularly important to plant heavily. You can use what we call starter plants as well, deliberately plant a load of real fast growing weeds, maybe some floating plants. And this is gonna help against that battle against algae. And then if you, get, if you find those plants are a bit of a pain after a while, you could just remove them. And by that point, the tank will have established a nice balance and you won't need those starter plants anymore. A typical kind of starter plants would be like Limnophila sassiflora, which is like a real, real fast growing weed, even in a non-CO2 tank. Okay, if we do add plants around here, they need to be really shade tolerant. So you could add more crypts, uh, Anubius, Java fern, uh, Buca philandra, they'd all do well around here, also around here. Okay, that's better. So that gives me more opportunity to attach more plants. Um, it's going to be hidden, so you're still going to get this three stone effect, or this might just look like one big stone, if that makes sense. Um, this also is going to help to weigh that wood down if it does want to float, so hopefully it will serve a couple of purposes. Okay, let's think about epiphyte, uh, more background plants. So we're going to be viewing it from straight on. If I was viewing it from the left, I'd probably keep away any background plants here. And again, if I was doing it from the right, I'd probably avoid background plants here because you want to be, have that view unobstructed. But because we're viewing it from the front, we could have potentially a nice kind of background uh, curtain effect. Or we could go more of an island and just focus on kind of plants around here and then keep, the, keep a lower plant down the left and right. So this is Bacopa calriana. This is another weed. So it's a great starter plant. And then if Martin gets fed up of trimming it, he can remove it and put something maybe slower growing in there. Um, super fast grower. Yeah, it'll grow outside. It's really kind of hardy, bit of a weed. But this is going to be great for that startup phase where we want to have really focus on healthy, fast plant growth. Interesting thing about stem plants is wherever you trim it from. So let's say this is this tall and you need to trim it. Wherever you trim it from, let's say there, that's going to generate two new stems. Okay, so we can use this to our advantage. We can create real bushy backdrops. But bear in mind, from below that point, it's going to start to become kind of shaded. And these lower leaves can drop off and die. As long as that top pass is really healthy, then don't worry about it. But just aesthetically, bear in mind that this lower portion doesn't look as attractive. So normally we kind of trim in deliberate places like where, the, where it's in line with the hardscape. So this bottom portion here is obscured by the hardscape um, and then you can just focus when you're looking at the tank from straight on you can't see this ugly bit and you just see the beauty beautiful new healthy growth does that make sense that's advanced tips that is i don't use stem plants very much because i find them quite high maintenance but they are brilliant for um, you know helping to keep algae away just creating a really nice dense appearance to the aquascape Okay, so we're fully planted now into the substrate. We've probably used 30 pots at least in there. So it shows, you know, that's not a cheap thing. But if you want to get the best start possible, you want to have something nice to look at right away, then you, need, you know, do need to invest appropriately in the right amount of plants. The danger of trying to sort of skimp on buying the plants at the beginning, you know, it's kind of fair enough. You've just spent, you know, a lot of money on a new aquarium system you might want to save a little bit of money on your plants. But the trouble is, if you, plant, if you don't plant heavily enough from the start, you're just going to get algae. It's going to put you off. You're fighting an uphill battle. So just buy, you know, loads of plants to start with. Make sure a good proportion of them are fast growing and you, shouldn't, you, know, you should have a good success. This is Anubius Nana. It's uh, named after the Egyptian god of death uh, because it can grow in the dark. Basically, there you go, fun fact. So, prepare it exactly the same way. This is an epiphyte plant. It needs to be attached to decor. So it's really important that it's rhizome, which is this, this fleshy part, 
where the leaves protrude from, that's called the rhizome. It's really important that that doesn't go anaerobic, which means um, starved of oxygen. So that needs to be attached, this is why it needs to be attached to decor ideally. You could potentially have the roots penetrating into a substrate, but you just need to make sure that that rhizome is exposed to circulating water so it can't go anaerobic. Now you can gently comb away the rock wall because it is going to be in the main water column. You are going to see it potentially, so you don't want to really be seeing that ugly rock wall if you can help it. It can tell a good quality plant when it comes from the nursery, the roots are actually going through the pot. Okay? Um, some other suppliers, they might um, sort of pot up cuttings and you'll see when you separate the wool, you'll just get like stems that have been cut off and then you might see some new root growth. Um, but you can tell a really good quality plant. It's been you know, matured for a long time in the greenhouse hydroponically. You can see the nice roots coming through. And pay attention to the roots themselves. If they're a nice kind of white color, that's good. If they start to go brown, it's a little bit stale and you might, you know, you might struggle with it. Uh, you can see kind of flower spikes that have come up. It's one of the few plants that will flower under water. It almost looks like a peace lily. These haven't quite opened up to show the white flower yet. But actually, I'll remove these because the, the plant's going to be using energy uh, on that flower. So if we take that off, it's going to put more energy into growing new leaves, okay? Now, I like to kind of cheat. Some people like to tie Anubius on or glue it on. I just like to find somewhere appropriate and then we can just wedge it in place. Getting towards the end of planting now. Book of Philandra, I think this is wavy green. This is a really new plant to the hobby, only been popular for about five to 10 years. Um, originally comes from Borneo, where it's kind of over farmed actually, and it's all part of this. In Borneo, they're kind of devastating the, the rainforest to make uh, palm, clear it for palm production. Um, and this stuff was kind of being farmed like crazy. Uh, so I, I would kind of encourage you to buy it from a, from a UK retailer that's buying it from a, a, a nursery where it's grown you know, in Europe with kind of environmental sustainability in mind. I prefer not to block, tend not to buy wild, wild plants, wild collected plants. Potentially come with disease as well. And you just don't know if that, the farming of that plant has had any kind of environmental impact. Okay, so not many, not much to play with here, but I'll just kind of strategically position it around this end here. This is really beautiful. Because the wood is so kind of beautiful on its own, we don't want to be particularly covering it up completely. You know, a java fern might even be overpowering for it. You know, you really want to have that nice wood telling the story. I've actually put a piece here to soften this. This anubia is here, it's quite bold on its own. If we just position that next to it, it's going to kind of soften that effect quite nicely, look more natural. And then similar up here. It's another epiphyte plant, so it likes to be attached to decor. Although again, you can potentially bury, this, bury the roots in the substrate, as long as that rhizome is exposed. Okay, so that's the tanks uh, scaped, planted. We're not gonna fill it with water today because Martin's taking it home. We talked about uh, aquascaping as a principle, as a therapy, you know, it's a, a beautiful thing to have in your home, helps you to connect with nature. And the whole process of aquascaping, you know, from that blank canvas of having that empty tank through to the creation process, which we've just done. And then the, main, the maintenance and watching it all grow in, you know, these are all really great things to enjoy with aquascaping. We talked about the actual aquarium system itself. Awaze Highline, this is the 300 model. This is their second largest model that they do. And we talked about, you know, it's German, and German engineering, really high quality. Everything's finished really lovely. It's got this unique kind of uh, filtration system and dry weir where you, you put your filter in the bottom. It's got a sliding drawer for ease of maintenance. It's got a drilled inlet there, so, you, you know, there's no ugly pipes in the tank. And then we've got a, a dry weir where all the electrical cables come through. So you can actually have the whole tank shifted right against the back wall. And then we 
we did the scaping. We installed the substrate. We talked about um, this substrate is quite inert, so we'd have to add root capsules or feed more liquid fertilizers through the, uh, using a liquid fertilizer in the water column to feed the plant roots. And then we talked about actually the, um, the importance of hardscape. You know, we started off with really bold wood and then we just kind of blended it in nicely with some stones which matched the, the gravel. Although eventually that gravel is going to be completely covered in plants in a couple of months or so, I would suggest. Then we, we chose our plants. We talked about the importance of choosing healthy plants and making sure we never have enough of them and making sure a lot of those are fast growers. And then we applied foreground, midground, background. We started off with the carpet of the mini hair grass, Eleocaris parvula, mixed in with some Monte Carlo. That's going to create a nice complex textured carpet. And then moving up to the Staragyne repens, planted around the rocks to act as a transitional plant. And we moved towards the back with, with a load of different crypts, probably six or so different species altogether of crypt in there. And then background, we talked about the focal point with the red plants. That's just off to the right here, almost by a third. This is going to create a nice red, bright red backdrop eventually. You probably can't see it right now, but when you're ready, you can come and have a closer look and you can see the red plant in the back. That's Ludwigia. And on either side of that, we planted a little bit of Bacopa cariana, which is one of these kind of starter plants, super fast growing weeds, helps to avoid algae in those early days. And then towards the back again, to the left and right, some more crypts. So eventually, in about, I don't know, two, three months or so, it will all be nicely grown in. They have a nice kind of dense foreground here, leading up, to the, leading up slightly to the Staragyne. And in the background, what I suggest to Martin, is he kind of prunes it like this, because the, the background stems are going to kind of come up here. So if you could prune it in like a dome shape. So we planted, and now it's time. Obviously, Martin's going to take it home. But it's really, let's just talk about maintenance quickly before I go into a Q&A. The first kind of few weeks are the most important time of an aquascape's life because if you start on the right path, do the right things, you're not going to get uh, punished with algae, which otherwise you will do. So we need to be focusing on uh, uh, big water changes, you know, change it at least two, three times in the first week, uh, and then, you know, two, two or three water changes in the second week, and after about a month or so, you could probably go down to uh, one water change a week, and I always change at least 50% of the water. Sounds like a lot of water. But as long as the water that you're supplying is the similar parameters to the water that's going out, that change isn't, it doesn't bother the fish. In fact, the fish seem to promote healthier behavior, more active behavior, just after a big water change. The water changes are really important for a few reasons. The biggest one is that it dilutes any kind of waste organics that can otherwise lead to algae. Uh, and it kind of just gives you more room for error, with, especially in a startup phase. So by doing these big, frequent water changes, we just really help to avoid algae, helps to keep the system fresh, whilst you know, down in the substrate and at a microbial level, everything's still maturing, these big water changes just to help flush out all these things that otherwise cause algae. Um, in terms of fertilizers, I would probably be adding, I like to dose every day, so I'd probably start off with dosing five or 10 mil of a decent liquid fertilizer every day to start with. You could probably avoid fertilizers for the first week or so, uh, but I like just to dose from day one. And then fil filter maintenance. Um, if you watch any of my videos on YouTube, the one I uploaded last night actually talks about the Biomaster filter maintenance in a lot of detail. So check that out if you haven't seen it yet. But it's got a quick release pre-filter, built-in heater, really easy to maintain, really good quality. And that's why I like to use the ORZ uh, Biomaster filters. Um, Lighting, uh, Martin's going to upgrade the lighting to something a bit more advanced. You, you probably would struggle to grow the carpeting plants with this stock lighting at the moment. Arguably might get away with it because we're going to be using CO2 injection, which gives you a lot more um, chance of success even with lower levels of lighting. Fish-wise, I would, I don't know, it's an interesting one. Mostly, we've got a lot of African, a lot of Southeast Asian plants. I like to think about the fish selection in terms of geography and also the, the size and color of the fish. So no, barbs might look quite nice in there, maybe. Barbs and barbs or danios, rasboras. I don't know why, it's not screaming tetras to me for some reason. It looks a bit too Asian to be sort of tetras, which uh, come from South, Af South America even. But yeah, that's obviously up to Martin. But tend to go for big shoals of one or two, maybe two species of fish. Try not to, in aquascaping, we tend not to mix loads of different species together. 
uh, and have you know one or one or two of each species. It just looks a little bit incoherent, a little bit chaotic. We try to keep the the theme of the fish with the theme of the aquascape. They're all part of the same kind of, you're telling the same story, so you all want to be coherent. So big shoals of small fish, these help to give you a, a good sense of scale in the aquascape as well. I'd like saying I'd have it on for about eight hours a day. CO2 injection, Martin's going to be using inline CO2, which is probably the best method for a larger aquarium. That CO2 mist is going to go all around the tank, feed the plants really well. Liquid fertilizers are going to feed the plant leaves. If we're going to use root capsules, they're going to help feed the plant roots. And then it's all about, we've got this really nice system promoting really healthy plant growth, avoiding algae growth, and then you're just going to watch it evolve and grow and really enjoy it, enjoy the maintenance, and live with a beautiful piece of nature.